Edward, I want, if we can, to go way back uh, to when you first arrived in London from Ghana. How old were you at that time? God, I think I was thir- I think I was just yeah, 13. 13. Yeah. Do you remember the sort of what the overriding emotion was as you arrived in London? Was it excitement? Was it? Oh my God. It was excitement. It was anticipation. It was fear of the unknown. But I remember just sort of seeing the buildings and seeing the people and just thinking, oh my God, this really is a new country. <laughs> and even the weather was different. Yeah. But it felt so exciting at that age. You speak in the book about this sort of perpetual forward motion that you have in your life. Yes. You're always moving forwards. And I wondered how much of that was already within you because yeah. of your family upbringing and, and maybe your culture and how much of it came about because of fleeing something or from... Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, you know, I mean, I, I was sort of essentially born in a military base. We grew up in a military base and then we had to leave the military base to go to a city of Tema, and then we had to flee our country because in the book I talk about the coup and how my dad's life was in danger. So when you have to leave one country for another, one home for another, I guess you're eternally searching for a home, isn't it? Mm. So you're always trying to find it. And I guess really that's what also propelled my life. What's next? And also the idea of nothing being permanent, I guess. So, you know, in London, then I moved out when I was 16, then I moved here, and, you know, I was always in perpetual motion because, yeah, we had to quickly leave the place. And this idea of having a sort of engagement with style, and then, of yeah. course, then later with, I suppose, with fashion, the idea of clothing, do you, do you have an idea of how quickly you realise that that's where your passion lay? Yeah, I mean, you know, I always sort of worked with my mother. My mother was a seamstress. So I was always with her, sort of sketching, helping her design, sort of, I always talk about sort of zipping women into their clothes. And so I was always around that, but it wasn't until I met a stylist mm. called Simon Fox, like, who actually discovered me on the train mm. and introduced me to this world of fashion in London at the time, sort of late eighties, that I realized this is really what I wanted to do. My mind was blown. And imagine London in the late 80s mm. and early 90s. And I realized I had a real passion for it as well, you know. I realized, my God, I really was very good at writing. I really was sort of good at this idea of this new profession called styling that I knew so much about clothes from my mother. So it must have been something that was there, but definitely meeting sort of my mentor sort of brought it out. As you say, Simon Foxton discovered you on the tube yes. and you were given these amazing opportunities at ID magazine, yes. but it did bring you into conflict with your own father. Yes. And you described this extraordinary moment when you were very young, yeah. where he effectively threw your clothes out yeah. of the window yeah. and you, you took that moment to just leave, didn't you? Yeah. Why was it so important for you to and Because my, my dad was sort of an African military officer, essentially. So he was very, you know, very disciplined, very precise. And he had ideas for his children. You know, we were going to be lawyers and doctors and sort of have, um, so be intellectuals, essentially. Mm. So be really the idea of being in fashion and not following that course. Also, he was from a generation who didn't really know what the media was. Mm. So when I told him I hadn't been going to Goldsmiths University and I'd been working at ID, out went the clothes, but, you know, I was ready to leave. You were 18 when you essentially took the reins of ID magazine. Yes. Which is that's, incredi- yeah. that's incredibly young to have yeah. that kind of responsibility, but it seems like you haven't really looked back since then. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of that forward motion, isn't it? That yeah. You're constantly yeah. moving forward. Yeah. ID seems like it was an amazing place to be at that time. Oh. ID was the most incredible place to work because I learned the job from all the different angles. One day I'll be shooting covers. The next day I'll be writing the shopping pages and styling them. And then the, another day I'll be sort of writing features. It was like a one-man training ground. 
Then I'd be in the art department laying out. And I always say those days, without those days, I wouldn't be here today. I really learned how to sort of operate a magazine from all the different advertising, how mm. they were selling. And we all sat in one room and we were all kids. And so we just saw each other work and we learned from each other. It was, it was an exciting time, the early 90s for ID. That kind of chaos <laughs> that you're describing, <laughs> I can see how that's really stimulating creatively. Yeah. And you talk about how you thought for a while that the personal chaos was maybe what was helping you to be so creative, yeah. but it took you some time to realize that yes. the destructive things like yeah. drinking, whatever, yeah. were not actually helping. How long did it take, I suppose, to, to realize? Yeah, I mean, it took me almost oh, took me quite a while because I was very shy growing up and sort of I discovered that, oh my God, when I drank, I was funnier, I was more outgoing, and I would work like, Crazy, we'd go out to a nightclub, go home, go to work, do it again, over and over. But you can do that when you're younger. And it wasn't until I was sort of in my early 30s that I decided, okay, I needed to sort of put the brakes on and really sort of focus on myself and my life and really gave up drinking for a very long time. Because the chaos wasn't where the creativity was coming from, you describe actually where it does come from, which is that often you wake up in the morning having dreamt the image or the idea. Is that still how you work? You yes, work? essentially. And I learned that, you know, when, you know, images came easily to me, not, you know, like most, I guess most editors would go to the shows and they'll see a yellow dress or, and that yellow dress would form a story. But my, my way was so different. I had to have a narrative. I had to have a, I had to have a character, almost like a, like a film. I had to have a character and she had to have an inner life, and it's like it's almost like child's play. Just have an inner life before I would even figure out what clothes she was wearing. And then I always say, you know, then I'll go to sleep, I'll, I'll pack it, and then I'll wake up and see all these images where she should be photographed, how she should look, how the hair and makeup should be. And for years I battled with that. I thought, oh my God, it was a shortcut, and I was cheating, and you know. And I wasn't really working as hard as other stylists to arrive at the solution. And I remember years later describing it to a friend and they were like, oh, that's what you call a gift, mm. right? So now I just literally, when yeah. things get really difficult, I, I, all right, I'm taking a break and I'll come back to it. And it always sort of works. What's really clear from the book as well is how much collaboration is important for you creatively, whether that's with regular photographers like Stephen Meisel, you describe your relationship working with him. But also I was surprised how much you work together with the models themselves. Oh, yes. Oh. That's clearly a really important part of the process too for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I always talk about models because I was one for a very short time. I was discovered by Simon Fox on the train. And because I was a model, you know, I went through sort of the, the rejection as well as, you know, the successes. But I always say, Nothing like modeling can make you feel uglier, make you feel more inferior. I think everyone looks around the models and think, oh my God, they're really beautiful, so the, the, the world is their oyster. But it's really sort of a lot of insecurity that they have to put up with sort of rejections of casting. You're not tall enough, you're not, you know, you're not light colored enough, etc., etc. So I, I had such a love for models that when it comes to work, you know, I talk about Kate, I talk about Naomi, I talk about Kristen McManamy, and Linda, but we were all the same age in the 90s. So it was real collaboration. We'd talk about characters. We'd talk about, you know, where we should shoot. We'll figure out ideas together. And really, when a model feels a part of the narrative, they give you that much more. You know, they, I always call them silent movie stars. You know, they don't speak. When a model's in front of a camera, emoting whatever scene you've given them, it's, it's pretty incredible. Obviously, you've worked with the biggest budgets imaginable when you're working around Vogue. And then when the pandemic hit, yes. suddenly that changes everything. And you had to work in new ways without those budgets, without those sets, what it might be. And you said that actually creatively, mm -hmm. that was quite useful because it took you back in a way to your ID days where you have mm -hmm. to just... Yeah. Which do you prefer? <laughs> I mean, of course I prefer now when I can see my team and, you know, when we can all work together. When the pandemic hit, I mean, 
we found ourselves all over London, sort of communicating with Zoom and having to put magazines, four issues out. You know, we couldn't be together, we couldn't organize photo shoots, uh, we couldn't send journalists to interview people. So yes, I went back to my ID days when, you know, you thought, okay, was it necessity is the mother, mother of invention? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we sent photographers to models' houses. We, you know, we, we got one, and a great photographer, Jamie Hawksworth, to literally follow essential workers around. They shot for the cover. We had Dame Judy Dench sort of isolated in a studio for a cover. Um, we had photographers go to sort of 30 activists all around the world, go to their houses and photograph them for the cover. So we learned to work in a new way. We learned to dig into the Vogue archives to create new images. So even though the, you know, it wasn't a great time creatively, it was unbelievable. And those four issues we did, the Dame Judy Dench cover. Oh, one issue we did, we thought, you know what, we need a break. We'd been in lockdown for a while. So I said, let's just have 14 landscapes on the cover by 14 of the, the best British artists. So hopefully in 10 years time, when you look back, you'll see, you know, Dame Diddy Dench, you'll see the landscapes, you'll see the essential work covers and the activists. And really what I was hoping that it would be a slice of history mm. that, you know, generations can look back and sort of know what, what that time was like. Mm. It sort of taps into what you say is the purpose, I suppose, of, of fashion and the work that you do, which is that very often fashion is written off as being unimportant. And actually, it can be incredibly important of in allowing people to see something. And you said that as you took over at UK Vogue, this idea of giving people an idea of a new form of Britishness. Yes. That's a really powerful thing to say. How, how well do you think that that's going? And is that still your sort of driving ambition? Yes, I mean, I feel, you know, I, mean, I was living in America. I moved to America where I was seeing Britain from the outside. Mm. And then Brexit happened. And all I heard from my American friends were, oh my God, your country's so xenophobic. Mm. Your country, what a country. And it was, but the Britain I remembered was one that welcomed my family. One that was so warm and a country where, you know, I mean, I grew up in Lubbock Grove where on any given day, you know, you'll see Rastafarians, you'll see aristocrats, you'll see, you know, people from all walks of life, all backgrounds. So that's a, I thought that really is, the Britain I wanted to show, that was the Vogue I wanted to create, a Vogue where everyone was welcome, sort of going back to the 70s, a Vogue where everyone could see themselves, regardless of race, regardless of age, religion, sexuality, everybody had to sort of um, be embraced. And, like, and that is going really strong. And for me, the most beautiful thing now is when I look at the media landscape and I look at all the magazines now who are all talking about inclusivity and you know, an industry that's really changing now and trying to sort of employ people behind the scenes, you know, models of all colours now on the runway. We're not there yet, but at least it's on the way. Sitting down to write a memoir means, of course, looking back on yeah. your life. And you said that you look back at your early work yeah. and feel quite proud, even though you say you can see the growing pain. Yeah. You can see this. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether there's something about that time you were working in where this is almost pre-internet, sort of. Oh, it was way that definitely we, pre-internet. Yeah. And so you're working purely in the magazine yes. form. When you were creating those covers, which now seem very iconic, yeah. did did they feel that they were going to be permanent at the time, or were you, are you surprised to? Look no, <laughs> we were just having fun. <laughs> it was me, Kate, and Naomi running down the the, the meatpacking district with sort of drag queens everywhere, showing them how to walk, or you know, <laughs> Björk having fun in a studio. We were just kids experimenting. Mm. And now everyone talks about the 90s. And for me, it was just a, a period of growing up. But the brilliant thing is that we were allowed to grow up. We were allowed to experiment, make mistakes. And now when I look back, I'm like, my, you know, we did great work. I mean, creativity was at its, you know, at its peak. Do you think that makes it harder now for people who are coming up to, to be that creative? Because we can see everything. It was a permanent record because of the internet. I mean, I always say yes and no. Yes, because, you know, yes, we had, you know, intense relationships with each other. You know, we had to, we spoke to each other multiple times a day to create that image. We'll shoot a fashion story, 10 pages, over, sometimes over three months, a picture of, 
a day. So the new generation didn't have that. But what they do have that we didn't have, they have, they have the internet. Right. You know, I see so many young people, photographers, hair, makeup, who get employed by someone just, just sending them a message on, um, on, <laughs> on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And in my time, you had to really go, you had to find an agent, you had to... So I think, you know, yeah, we had less. So maybe we, we, had to, we were forced to use our imaginations more, maybe. You also share a lot about the, 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 the personal struggles you've had. Yes. Um, particularly with your health. Yes. You work incredibly hard. This is very cool. Oh my God, no. <laughs> to the point of, you know, making yourself almost ill. But I just sort of wonder whether that... Is, is it hard to control that sort of creative urge, and as you say, that, that desire to move forwards and to look after yourself occasionally? And is that any easier now that you're a married man? Have you got somebody who says, just calm down? <laughs> oh my God, my partner works harder than I do. So, <laughs> the video director. I mean, what I've learned now is how to take care of myself. Yeah. You know, it's okay to take weekends off. It's okay mm -hmm. to take time out for yourself. It's okay to go to the doctors mm -hmm. regularly. It's okay to, you know, have even basic, you know, massages, but self-care is now more important. But I guess when I was younger, because I was on such a forward mission and a forward trajectory, yeah. I didn't think there was a minute to stop. Someone should have just said, sit down, take a few days off. <laughs> but you know, when you're young, you don't really know that. And also because I started so young, yeah. you know, you can't say no, you want to, Please, everyone, you want to get everything done. You want to work 48 hours. But now I know when to stop and I know when to take a break and I know when to ponder on things. And, you know, it's age, isn't it? And now I'm married. Yeah, hopefully I'll slow down. <laughs> Back in Ghana as a child, yes. um, one, one of your names was Asiyama. Asiyama, yeah. Which means blessed child. Yeah. I wonder, looking back, whether you feel that way? Oh my God, 100%. I mean, you know, fate has played a very important role sort of in my life, whether it's, you know, leaving the country or being spotted on the train or the many, many opportunities I talk about in the book. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely, definitely blessed. But I also know that, you know, you can be blessed and you can have so many opportunities, but you need to work. Whatever talent you're given, you need to work at it. You need, you need to just not take it for granted. You need to, you know, push it, experiment with it, know when things are working, know when things are not, keep questioning it, you know, but never assume that it's here to stay. I never did, you know. So, um, yeah, it's very, very important to know if you're blessed, you still have to work.